Okay. So if I could get UniWide working, I would show you the, uh, the class web page where I've added a, um, an update on assignment one. Um, I made, I hacked together a little demo of my own submission for assignment one. So if you want to see what sort of things that I would be expecting, um, you can have a look at that. Um, the, so the aeroplane behavior more or less has to, your aeroplane behavior more or less has to imitate what I've done there. You might choose to make it look slightly different. I, I mean, I don't care aesthetic differences as long as you've kind of got the same roll and pitch and forwards moving, which you would be able to see if you could go and play it. Um, the, um, the, the other things in the world, you know, totally up to you what you add, but, um, but you need two separate things that are moving around in the world. Um, I added a, uh, uh, so I made a, a cityscape with lots of buildings and I added a blimp flying around and around one of the buildings and a bunch of little cars that would actually run away when the plane come near, came near um, just for something to do. Um, so, but you know, your mileage may vary. You can do whatever you want in your, in your other things as long as you have your airplane flying around. Um, so, we're going to continue on the asteroids task today. Uh, so we got it as far as actually doing screen wrapping, I think, last time. Um, and we have previously looked at keyboard control, but I'll go back over that in a little bit more detail to, uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on in the code that we were writing. And then we'll start adding the asteroids to our scene. So we'll move on from, um, from the ship move. We'll remove this ship move zero script because we're not going to use that anymore. And we'll move on to, I've got a better, newer version. Here we go. So this is our ship move one script, which will look like what we were doing in the, uh, in the lab last week. So if we uh, have a look at that script. So in this script, we, um, again, it's in the update function. So, um, so we're, we're doing this on every single update of the ship. Um, and very simply, we've got four if statements there that test for each of, the, uh, each of the keys that we might want to press, and we do something appropriate for each of those keys. And so if, the, um, if you're pressing the up key, then we use the translate function to move in the up direction, which is forwards in this, in this case. Down will move backwards, left, will ro left and right will rotate us, and um, the rotate function takes three arguments. This is a rotate around X, rotate around Y, and rotate around Z. Um, since Z is the one pointing out of the screen, rotating around Z will move, will turn the ship left and right. So that's the, that's the axis we want to rotate around. So if we run that, um, and now if we use the keys, I can go up and down, and I can turn left and right. And turning is a bit slow, and moving is a bit fast. Um, but it does what I want. It doesn't really follow the kind of, oh, and we've still got our wraparound code on there, so it wraps around when we get at the edge of the screen. Um, that code is still on from last, from the last lecture. And so that works, and we can fly around with that. Now, like I said in the last lecture, um, we've got here a lot of magic numbers, right? Um, this one means turn at one degree per frame. Whatever, whatever that is, which probably means about one degree uh, every 30th of a second, so 30 degrees per second. Um, that's really an arbitrary number that, um, that rather than have it written in our code, it's much better to, uh, to take it out and give it a name. And so, so the first thing we probably want to do with this code is to, um, if I can find the cursor, is to replace both of these with, with a turn speed. Um, variable and so that makes it all a bit neater and if we make it up if we put it up here and make it a public variable um, and we'll make it a float and we'll say that it's equal to one for starters now that code will do exactly the same thing as what we had before so now if we rerun that it should still do the same thing turn slowly yep but now we have a um, on our ship, we have a turn speed here, so if I want to change that to 10, I can change it, 
and now I turn, now hopefully when I run, when I play, I turn much more quickly, and so I do much smaller circles. Um, now notice something important here, you can actually change these variables while you're running the program. Um, Unity is perfectly happy for you to do that. Um, but the thing to note is that when I, if I change this to 10, um, and if I now stop the game, it changes back to the value that it started with. Um, so that's a trick. Um, it's a nuisance sometimes. Sometimes it's good because it allows you to experiment with values and know that Unity will remember the values that you started with. But sometimes it's a nuisance because you're tuning a value and you get the right value in, in there um, as you're running the game, and then you, then you stop the game and that value is lost. Um, so you've got to remember, if, you're, if you are tuning these values while running the game, you've got to write down the numbers so that when you stop the game, um, the numbers that you chose will uh, we'll be able to type them in again. Because so if, say we want to say five seemed like a good number there, um, that, that might be a good thing. There we go. So now we can turn on the spot and we can move forwards and backwards. Now it's still not really the kind of behavior that we want for, a, um, for our asteroid ship because we don't have any momentum. We can really stop. We said in our, in our, um, we said in our, in our, um, storyboards that we actually wanted the ship accelerating and decelerating rather than rather than just moving forwards and moving backwards and stop it, starting and stopping whenever we wanted to. So we might want to fix that in, uh, in our code. Um, but, you know, it works. So the, um, let me just look at what, oh, so we also, if we wanted to have, um, to be able to change the speed, we're again moving one, uh, moving forwards and back one unit per frame. We might want to have a variable speed for that as well, which says that um, we'll scale that, ver that vector by, by the speed, and we can also have another, give that an, another named variable, var speed, again it's a float, and again it might start out at one, but we can tune it, and so now we can tune the ship's speed, should it hopefully appear over here, yep, there it is. So now we can tune the ship's speed so that make it faster, and now, Hopefully, when we go back over here, now the ship moves faster, or we can make the ship move really slow if we want. And now the ship moves very slowly. All right. So, so remember what I said in the last lecture is that having magic numbers in your code that are just a number that has no meaning attached to it, no obvious meaning attached to it, is a bad thing. Um, the computer doesn't care, but it makes your code harder to understand and harder to um, harder to maintain. And it makes it easy, having these named variables makes it much easier for you to tweak their values and adjust your code, tune your code to make get the behavior you want. Um, if we really wanted to be, uh, uh, we won't go there yet, we'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some other, some of the theory before we go on. So, so one of the important things we encountered here that I haven't really properly explained is the idea of functions. Um, when we're calling input.getKey, this, this is a method. It's a familiar syntax for calling a method on something. But in this case, it's a method that returns a value. So it's a method that does something and gives you a, an answer back again. Um, so we usually call those kind of methods functions. Now, like I said, we kind of use function and method interchangeably at many points. But usually a method is a, is a piece of a block of code that does something, and a function is a block of code that does something and returns a value, gives you an answer back. So a, method, a function is usually, if you want to ask some question of, uh, like, is, is this key being pressed? And that's a function. It has an answer, yes or no. Or, um, or what is the, uh, where is the mouse position would might be a function, or what is the distance between this, this object and that object. They're all examples of functions. It's an idea that you have a, you have some input, you, give, you tell it some, you ask, you're basically asking the computer a question and it gives you some sort of answer back again. So input is a function that takes a uh, key name as its input and its output is a Boolean, uh, either a true or false. And you can see that if we look at, um, don't, do that, that has nothing, not at all important right now. If we look in the API, input, if we search for input, we can find input.getKey, it's down here. And it tells us, this, uh, this description tells us exactly that. Let me zoom in on that. Um, 
So this description says that it's a function, uh, it's called get key, its input is a, is a name, it's a string, and its output is a bool. And so we know that this is going to be, uh, if, we, if we give it the name of a key as an input, it'll give us a, a, a boolean as an output. Now the other thing to notice about this um, is that this has this label static applied to it. Um, there's a difference between static and non-static methods. Um, and let's see if I can think of what that is. Um, a static method is basically a method that you call on a class, and a non-static method is one that you call on an object. Um, and you don't really need to understand that right just yet, so I won't go into that in more detail because it'll be confusing. Um, but for the time being, just uh, you know that a get key, you can because it's static, means that you can call it directly without having an object to refer to. So, um, getting back here. So, methods and functions can have parameters. So I said you, you give it an input. Um, the way to give it that input is in the, in the parentheses after the, after the function name, you have a, co a comma separated list of the parameters. Um, input.getKey has one parameter, and that's the name of the key. And so you, in that parentheses, you'll put the name of the key as the, as the input to that function. Um, you might have several different inputs, in which case they will be in, listed in order um, uh, inside those parentheses. If there are no inputs, then, then we'll just have that empty pair of parentheses, which says there's no input to this function. We don't have to tell it, give it any information. Um, the order of the parameters is important. Um, if you look in the API for any, any, if you look up any function in here, for example, if we look up transform dot rotate, there's a nice example that I know off the top of my head. Um, transform dot rotate is a method. Here we go. It has, let's look at this version here. Transform dot rotate. So here it's a, function called rotate, it takes in one, two, three, four arguments, right? So there are four parameters, or parameters or arguments both mean the same thing. I'm going to kind of use those two names interchangeably. So four parameters. The first one is the x-angle and it's a float. The second one is the y-angle, it's a float. The third one is the z-angle and it's a float. And the fourth one is a relative to, which is a space. Um, which basically means, well, I said before that um, you can most normally translate and rotate are within the local space of the object. You can specify this parameter to say, I want it to happen in a different space. Now in the docs you'll see here that relative to has this equals something after it. That means the relative to is actually optional. Um, and if you don't specify it, this is the value it will use. So if you don't specify what you're rotating relative to, it'll be its own, its self space. Um, the, op the alternative there would be to put, to spe specifically say, I want you to rotate in the world space, or I want you to rotate in somebody else's space, or something like that. But normally you won't care about this, you'll just leave that out, and the default value will apply. So you can just use three arguments, just X, Y, and Z, and that one will automatically be filled in. Now the other thing to notice here is that at the end it says that this, is a, this returns void. So the type of this function is void. Void means there is no return. Um, void is, is just a simple way of saying nothing. nothing. Nothing is returned. So a method that just does something will have the return type void and that means it doesn't give you an answer back. A, method, a function that actually expects to give an answer back will have a different type here. It'll say it returns a float or it returns a bool or it returns a vector. Um, so an example, another example, if we go say and look at um, the camera, the camera has um, a bunch of, whoops, there we go. So every camera has a bunch of functions on it. Um, for example, the screen to world point function. Um, and if we go up, there we go. Screen to world point function. It's a function. Uh, it's called screen to world point. Its input is a vector, and its output is also a vector. Um, and so that will take a uh, point on the screen and convert it to a point in the world, um, which you might use later if you're doing anything with the mouse. 
Um, this is a way to take the mouse position and convert it to a point in your world so that you can then, um, you know, manipulate things in the world using, the, using that position. So the general idea of a function is that it takes in some input and it gives you back some output. Um, and you really don't need to, and the nice thing is because we, it provides abstraction, we don't have to care about how this function works or what goes on inside. We just have a description of what it does and we can rely on it to do that. And the, um, the code that's inside that is invisible to us and we don't have to care about it. So I said, I already, no, I already said it, but so functions and methods are identical except for the return values. Um, the return values can be used anywhere a value is, ex is, is expected in our code. So it's, it's like an expression that we talked about before. Whereas before expressions, we said they were arithmetic or comparisons with different kinds of expressions. The return value of a function is also an expression. So if we want to take, if we want to use this world to screen point to transform some point, we can then assign that to a variable if we want. Or alternatively, if we're expecting a Boolean value in the condition of an if, um, then a function that returns a Boolean value is a, is a valid condition to put in there. Um, so functions are ways of taking complicated bits of, co uh, bits of computation and compressing them down to a single name so that we don't have to worry about um, exactly how this works. We can just treat this as a unit. So, I'm going to actually uh, show you this one. No, I've done that one, this one. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go through this one in detail, but there's a slightly better version of the, um, so I'm gonna remove that script, remove script component. So this is a, um, slightly more advanced version of the move script. Um, what I've done now is actually written quite, something quite long. This get, lets us actually keep track of our speed. And so rather than when we get, we have a speed variable as before, but it starts out at zero, which means that the ship isn't moving. Now the speed is not gonna be uh, how fast do we move when we press the key, it's how fast are we moving at any point in time. So on every loop, uh, if we ignore this, on every loop down the bottom here, it says we move up by the amount of speed. So, um, so it, and every single time, let me sc scroll up so you can see that a little bit better. This statement is run on every loop. So on every loop, we move up by whatever speed we're currently moving at. Um, but what we, what we have now is if we press the up key, we add some acceleration to our speed, and so we start moving faster. If we press the down key, we subtract the acceleration from the speed and so we're moving slower. And uh, we've got to make sure that if our speed goes less than zero, that it, we set it to zero so that our down key is just a break and not something that makes us go backwards. Um, but this now means that we can, um, we can keep track of speed as a state of our, of our ship. So our ship has um, some speed that can ma maintain, ugh, keeps the same on every frame unless we press a key to speed up or slow down. Um, and then we move by that, and then I've got the same code as before for turning left and right. So, um, so what this means now is if we play this new script, uh, see I changed something while it was running and now it has to change it back again. Change back to that, there. So now we start out, we're not moving at all. If I press up, I accelerate, but if I let go, I keep moving because the speed is remembered from frame to frame. Um, now if I press, if I keep pressing up, I'll speed up to a maximum, that's about my maximum speed. If I press down, it'll break. Now the, um, as, now I can speed up more slowly and break, and my acceleration is pretty major. Let me turn down my acceleration a little bit so that I don't accelerate quite so fast. So now if I, should see me speed up and slow down. There we go. Uh, it's actually accelerating and decelerating rather than just go start stopping and starting. And I can still turn around and everything like I did before. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Um, so this isn't doing, using any new code that you haven't, like any new kinds of code that you haven't seen before. 
But the, uh, the critical thing here now is that speed, rather than just being a parameter for our, for our um, rather than just being a parameter for our behavior that we can adjust so that we want it to be a different speed, it's actually a state of our ship at any point of time. Um, and we can update that, sp that state as, um, in our, in, in when we press a key. So the speed of the ship um, is a variable that the, uh, is a value that we're keeping track of as we go. And sometimes we'll make it bigger and sometimes we'll make it smaller as we manipulate it. Um, so you probably, no, you probably won't need to do this for your assignment because all the state will be, will be fine. But, um, but in general, uh, your, your objects are going to have more state associated with them um, so that as you, um, you know, uh, vary, there will be various things that you want to change about, keep track of about your object as, as uh, you go through time in your, in your game. And, um, and so you can keep track of them in a variable on the object in the same way that you'd uh, specify a variable for just tuning your behaviors. All right. So we can play more with that a bit later. I want to get on to making some asteroids um, because our space is currently a bit empty. So our goal for this second prototype is to make asteroids moving in random directions, wrap them around at screen boundaries like we were doing the ship, and create multiple asteroids at screen startup. So let's stop there. So I'm going to create an asteroid. Um, so let's make an asteroid. An asteroid can be a sphere. Um, I've already got um, an asteroid. There's our asteroid. And I've already got an asteroid skin for it, so let's just add that. So, and let's move it somewhere where we can actually see it. Um, let's move it over here. Can we see that? Yes, it's a bit small. It's a bit of a tiny little asteroid, so let's make it bigger. Um, scale it up by two, two, two. Is that a nice size asteroid? That's still a bit tiny. Let's scale it up by 20, 10, 10, 10. There, well, it's probably a bit huge, but well, what the hell. It's a nice big asteroid. Um, and we'll just move that a bit away from the ship. Actually, that's... Let's set its, its position up, its Z position is. Let's put it back in the, middle of the in the middle of the screen and then move it to where we want. So we want to move it that way. Right. There we go. Okay, so we've got a nice big moodily lit asteroid there, uh, which you can actually see, that's good. Um, so at the moment that won't do anything. That asteroid will just sit there and we can fly around it and fly, whoops, fly through it if we want. Doesn't really matter. Um, but now what we want to do is rather than have that asteroid, um, first of all, what we want our asteroids to appear, rather than always appear there, we want our asteroids to appear somewhere randomly on the screen. Um, the second thing we want to do is make it start moving and we want to make it start moving in a random direction. So we're now going to add a script to that asteroid um, and I think I have an asteroid. Uh, no, okay, we'll create a... Yeah, I have an asteroid moved. No, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to create a new script. So we're going to add a script to the asteroid to make it move. Create JavaScript. Uh, okay. So now... <clears throat> all right. So we're going to have... The bit we already know how to do is we'll say we have a direction in which the um, the... the the, it's going to move and that's going to be a vector um, and we can say transform dot translate oops dot capital T translate T for translate not R for translate in that direction and that will make a, an asteroid which moves in whatever direction we start so and if we now put that let's call that uh, asteroid move zero. So we now put that on our asteroid wherever we put it. There it is. Let's actually rename that to asteroid. Um, now initially we have that asteroid move zero thing. We have a direction vector that we can set. We're going to make it move mm, 0 0.5 that way or whatever, 0 0.4 that way and 0 0.2 that way. And so when we run 
There it goes. And off it goes into the wilderness because we don't have any, any code on it to wrap it around. But I, we already wrote that wraparound script last time. So we talked to, I talked when I wrote that about how we would be able to reuse that. So we can reuse that script now. Um, the script that we put on the ship, we can reuse it to put on the asteroid. So let me find that. It was in here. No, not in there, in there. In there, open up. There's the wraparound script. Let's put the wraparound script on the asteroid as well. And now hopefully, yeah, our asteroid wraps around. Okay, cool. Oh, and you can see that, that's good. Um, so the same script that we used on the ship, we can use on the asteroid and it does, does the same thing. So nice example of code, code reuse there. We don't have to rewrite that script all over again. We can just use it, um, use it in both cases. So now we have an asteroid that's moving around the screen, but the problem is that asteroid is always going to move in that same direction, and that's not going to be much fun because the player is always going to know that asteroid is that way, and what we want to have is a bit of randomness in our game. So what we need to do is every time we start, every time we create a new asteroid, we need to set that direction randomly. Um, so what we can do is create a, a, a start function that does that as soon as we create, so the start function, like I said before, is an event handler that, that is run as soon as the object is created. So, um, so we can create a, 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 a start handler to, to randomly set the, um, could not overwrite, that's because I changed the name. Let me, uh, let me undo that. Do save, come back over here. Sorry, I just, I just renamed the script and it doesn't like it if you rename the script while you're editing it. Um, Let's type that in again. Function start. Okay, so now what we want to do in here is set the direction to a random angle. Okay, so we're going to have a variable called angle, which is going to be the angle that we want to set it in to make it go. Uh, and we're going to have to find out what that angle is. Um, now, Unity provides a class called random, which is a very convenient thing for generating random numbers. So the uh, Unity random.value, if we uh, zoom in, the value field on the random class, every time we ask, normally a, normally a field will have one value in it and every time we call it, will give us back that same value until something changes it. The random class is special. Every time you ask for a value, it gives back a different value. Um, so the, and that value is always between 0, 0, 0 and 1, no, 0.0 and 1.0. So it's a floating point number, but it's from between 0 and 1, inclusive. So it may be 0, it may be 1, or it may be any number in between. Um, so we call it, it might, the first time we call it, it might give us a half. The second time we call it, it might give us a third. The third time we call it, it might give us any other number. It's a random, randomly chosen number. Um, this is really useful for what we want to do because it means that every time we create an asteroid, we can just use this random number to, to work out where, which way that asteroid's going to go. So what we say is we want the angle. Now, the random gives us a value between 0 and 1, right? But we want the angle that we're moving to be between 0 and 360 degrees, right? So we take the random dot value and we multiply it by 360. And that gives us a number between 0 and 360, right? Now we need to make our direction vector point in that, in that direction. So our direction vector is, the easiest way to do that is to start with a direction pointing in a known, in a known way, so that initially the, the direction can be the up vector, and then we'll rotate that direction by, by that angle. Um, and I've forgotten how to do that, so I have to look at the, the, um, the script. So we can vector, vector 3, we can make a vector, uh, um, um, rotate, this should be a rotate function. Dum, 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 dum. There must be a method to do this. Oh, okay, there isn't a method to do what I want. Oh, okay, I know what I've got to do. Actually, I've got to create a quaternion. This is going to be a nuisance, but anyway, quaternion. 
Actually, I wonder if there's an easier way of doing that. Vector three. Uh, okay, we'll have to create a quaternion. So I said in previous lectures that quaternions are used for rotations. So we can create a quaternion using, using, uh, sorry, this is a bit, ah, here we go, okay. So we want to use the angle axis uh, method to create a quaternion that rotates it in the right way. So we'll say um, quaternion, oh sorry, var q equals quaternion dot angle axis and that takes, that's so again it's a function, it takes the input to the function is the two, two inputs, the first one is the angle which is a float, the second one is the axis which is a vector and it returns one of these quaternion objects which is a rotation, a, ro a thing that does a rotation. Um, so we say angle axis, the first thing is the angle which we've already worked out, the axis then is the, um, like I said previously, the axis will be the, which way, the forward vector which is the one pointing out of the screen. Um, and then we should be able to do direction equals Q times direction. So multiplying a vector by a quaternion rotates that vector. So what we've done here is we've started, let me, actually let's tidy this up a little bit. Let's move that down to there. Right. So, so what we've done, we've taken a random number between zero and one multiplied it by 360 to create a random number between 0 and 360. We've then created a quaternion which does rotation for us. It rotates by that angle around the forward vector which is the one pointing out of the screen so it'll rotate clockwise around there. It then um, takes the up vector and rotates it by however much that was. So if this was 45 degrees it would take the up vector and rotate it by 45 degrees to there. And so whatever this is it then gives us a vector pointing in a random direction. So now, when we run our game, hoping that everything has worked, oh, it moves that way, and we run again, and it moves a different direction, and we run again, and it moves a different direction, and we run again, and it moves a different direction, and hopefully it'll always, yeah, lots of different directions. So now, we, by using the random number generator, we've actually managed to make the, uh, the asteroid do something different every time we do it. Now we can do a similar thing to, uh, to randomly set the position of the asteroid in the world, um, although I won't, look, uh, I won't go into that right now because, uh, yeah, no. So, so this is what we're just talking about. Um, the random class um, has this value field which allows us to choose a random number. Okay, the next thing I want to actually talk about, I want to go on to talking about loops in our code. Um, so if we were, if this was a, a, a real game of asteroids, what we'd want to do is create lots of asteroids rather than just one asteroid. Um, so, but rather than say create, an astero create one asteroid here, create another asteroid there, create another asteroid there, it'd be nice to be able to have a loop in our code which just says do this, create, create three asteroids or create five asteroids or create however many asteroids we want. Rather than saying create an asteroid, create an asteroid, create an asteroid, create an asteroid, it just gets boring during repeating your code. So if you do have um, repetitions in your code, um, the way to represent them is to use a loop. Um, there are two kinds of loops that we'll be dealing with. Four loops which are definite loops, which say if we know a fixed number of times you want to do something, we'll use a for loop. And while loops which are indefinite loops, which means that we just keep executing the loop until some condition becomes true. Now we're going to look at for loops first and we'll look at while loops a bit more uh, in a later lecture. So, so a for loop is, is the kind of loop we use when we want to execute a block of code a, number of, a known number of times. Um, and again, this is, this is abstraction. We could, we could write out the block of code. If we wanted to do something 10 times, we could write out the block of code 10 times but obviously that's going to get error prone and it just gets hard to read and difficult. And if we want to run a number of times specified by the user, so if the user types in 10, we want to run 10 times. If the user types in 20, we want to run 20 times. Then we can't just write the body of code out 10 or 20 times. We've got to actually have the computer calculate how many times to run the code. 
So a for loop does, uh, does this. A for loop gives us a way of taking a block of code and running it many times. And the, and the number of times that it is run is specified by this condition, uh, these three parts here in the, in, the, uh, in the header of the for loop. So the syntax in general is we have four, and then in parentheses we have these three parts, which I'll go into detail, and then again in curly braces we have a block of code. And everything in the block of code gets run repeatedly. So breaking it up, there are four important parts. There's the initializer, there's the guard, there's the increment statement, and there's the body. And what they do is the initializer is run once when we start the loop, uh, and it sets up the, the initial situation. So in this case, our initializer creates a variable i and sets its value to zero. Um, i is going to be our counter for how many times we're doing, we're doing this loop. Um, so the first time we run this loop, a new variable i is created and it has value zero. Then the guard is the test to see how many times we're going to do this loop. The guard is tested on every loop before the uh, body is executed. And if it's true, the, the loop is executed again. And if it's false, the loop stops. So going back here again, as long as the variable i is less than 10, we keep executing the loop. Um, so it starts out at zero. If it's less than 10, we execute the loop. If the value gets to be 10 or more, we stop. Um, so that's what the guard does. It tells you when to stop executing the loop. The increment statement is run on every loop, but it's run after the body is executed. And the role of the increment statement is to move on to the next value. So the value, uh, the value is z starts at zero, it's less than 10. Then once we've executed, the, the body will increment it and we'll increment it to one. And then we'll run the body again and then we'll increment again and increment it to two. Finally, the body is the code that you want to, to run on every loop. Um, and so the body is run every time you, you execute the loop. So to give you an example, here's a very simple loop. Um, the, uh, the initializer is i equals zero, var i equals zero. The guard is that i is less than two. And the incrementer is the plus plus operation, which you remember just adds one to the va value of i. Um, so, and then the body is simply a print statement which prints out the value. Um, and this is, I don't know if I've talked about this in lectures, but it's useful um, if you're debugging your code, the print statement prints out onto the console. So if there are uh, calculations that you're doing in your code that you want to see what the results of the calculation are, you can use a print statement in your code to do that. So this is very simply, simply this is going to run this loop twice and, and print out the values of i each time. So if we start, um, so the first thing that happens is the initializer is run and the value of i is, in, is initialized to zero. The second thing that happens is that the guard is tested. Zero, the current value of i is zero. Zero is less than two, so that's true. So we're allowed to execute the loop. The third thing that happens is we execute the body of the loop um, and we print out the value of i, which is zero. Then we go up to the incrementer and we execute the incrementer. So i was zero, it's now going to be one because the plus plus operation adds one to a variable. We go back again. We go back to the beginning. We, we don't do the initializer again, it's only done once, but we go back and test the guard again. Now one is less than two, so, so we're allowed to keep going. <coughs> we execute the body, we print out the value one this time. After we've finished executing the body, we go up to the incrementer and we increment i and it's now equal to two. We now test the guard. Two isn't less than two, so that's false. So we stop and that's the end of the loop. So the, you can see the loop, is a way, the loop is a way of doing something repetitively. Um, each step we increment the value of the loop counter and, uh, and we test it against some limit that we want it we, uh, so we set it to its initial value, we increment it on each loop, we test it against some limit, and we keep executing until it reaches that limit. Um, we don't have to do counting upwards. This is just a typical example. We could count downwards. So if we start by incrementing, we start by setting the value of i to 10, 
on each loop we will subtract one from i, which is the minus minus, which I don't think I've talked about before, but it's the opposite of plus plus. It subtracts one um, every time you run it. And we, uh, and we keep running as long as i is greater than or equal to one. So this will count down from 10 to one. It'll, uh, and when the value will get to the zero, the guard will be false and it'll stop. Um, we can count by threes or any other value. If we started at five, initialize to five, keep going until we reach 13 and add three on every loop and that would count five, eight, 11 and then it would stop because on the fourth, in fourth loop it would be 14 which is greater than 13 and so it would stop. We can even count from, we can even sort of double, so we can count from one to 256 every time we go through the loop we, we double and this will print out one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, so forth. Um, so it's quite flexible how we use this, but you'll almost always uh, write code that almost every, every, every for loop looks like this. Every, almost every for loop looks like you start at zero, you're counting up to some maximum value, and every, every loop you add one to the value. Um, so, and you'll write this code, so this is basically a way of saying, do this operation two times. So I start at zero, I do, do it on zero, I do it on one, and then when the value reaches two, I stop. And so effectively this means do this, the body of this loop two times. Now you'll see this a, a lot. There are a number, lot of occasions in code where you say, do this code five times, do this code 10 times, do this code however many times um, the player specifies. And so you'll, run, you'll write a lot of loops like this. In our code, just before we go, if we wanted to create, uh, actually that's going to be tricky. Oh, I'll, I'll show you some of it and then there's a bit that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to um, elide over for the moment. But in our code, um, here's the code that I'm going to be using for creating asteroids. Now, there's a function here which creates an asteroid which I'm not going to go into details about yet. Yet, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. But the important thing is, in the start method, we have, this, we have a for loop here which says we have a number variable which, the, uh, which is one of the global variables that we specified. This is the number of asteroids that we want to create. So when we start this, met, this, uh, this function, we will run through this loop creating as many asteroids as, as we've specified. So then if we wanted to create a world with five asteroids in it, we just set this value number to five and this script would run and create five asteroids. If we wanted to create a million asteroids, we'd set the value to a million and it would create a million asteroids for us. Um, so a for loop is a really easy way of making your code do, this, do an operation a set number of times. And um, whenever you're dealing with multiple things in the world, you'll use for loops a lot. Um, we're probably out of time. I, um, I'll, for those who weren't, weren't here at the beginning, I still don't have internet access, so I still can't show you. But on the blog, there is a, um, a playable version of the, um, of the assignment one. In your assignment, um, the submission specs should be up today. I think Rez is going to post them today. In your assignment, what, what we're going to want you to submit, so in, in this week's lab, you're going to be showing your tutor your, your uh, storyboards. Um, then at the end of next week, you're going to be just submitting your script files. But what we're, what we're going to do is show you how to um, compile your game and stick it on the web. Um, and so then you'll actually also send us your, uh, the location of your game so we can pl play it on the web. Um, uh, and then you can also, if you want, play each other's games on the web. Um, so I'll add something to this week's lab to show you how to do that. I haven't actually ridden the lab yet, so the people in my class get to turn up and find, and we make it up as we go along. Thanks a lot.